Christophe Guillou. I'm the new Director of Sustainable Development at the Ministry of Europe and, and Foreign Affairs. On behalf of the Permanent Secretariat of the Leading Group on Innovative Financing for Development, hosted by the Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs of France, that was created back in 2006, I'm very pleased to open this session. We have the opportunity to discuss a topic that is key to solving today's challenges. How do we mobilize more funding and how can we innovate to involve all actors towards this objective? If you look at the international context, the world is facing an educational crisis of unprecedented magnitude that has exacerbated existing inequalities particularly for women and girls and the most marginalized and vulnerable young people. Education remains a strong priority of French officials in developing countries. In 2021, we dedicated 1 billion euros to education financing. Alongside UNESCO, France also initiated in November 2021 the Paris Declaration to calls on state to make education a priority of strategies, policies, and budget, to increase the volume of funding, and to improve the equity and efficiency of spending on education. This situation reminds us of the immense need for sustainable international cooperation, solidarity, and innovation. We must collectively do more to finance the Sustainable Development Goals. And we need to use innovative financing to provide stable and sustainable resources, especially for education. In 2010 and 2012, the leading group has already taken part in an inventory of the most promising mechanism in this field. 10 years later, it was time to define a new action strategy adapt to the post-pandemic context. In a few minutes, you will discover the first result of this study conducted by COIS. It shows that significant work has been done to tap into innovative financing for education. New tools are emerging to encourage private investment towards this underfunded social sector. France has committed to this type of mechanism by launching in 2019, as part of its G7 presidency, its first matching fund with UNICEF dedicated to empowering girls in Mauritania through education. In this fund, every euro invested by the private sector was matched by funds from the Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs of France. It's a rather simple mechanism and has an effective tool, and it is an effective tool to create a joint momentum with the private sector. We hope this new study will provide keys to identify other innovative financing models focused on national needs that will be worth scaling up. I hope that our exchanges will be as fruitful and constructive and that they will be enable us to move forward towards more effective and collaborative education financing, thanks to innovative solutions. I would like now to give the floor to, Madame, to Her Excellency, Madame the Minister, Moni Dipu, Minister of Education of Bangladesh. Madame Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Excellencies, as we gather here, the humankind appears to be on a self-destruction mode, be it through wars, ethnic and religious conflicts, denial of true democracy, climate change, parochial views based on nation-state supremacy, race, religion, and gender biases, cyber crimes, unregulated use of new technologies, indiscriminate spread of virulent misinformation, just to name a few. A vast majority of the global population 
is being held hostage to the whims of a few. But have we thought that with every bullet fired, we are killing off a book? With every missile launched, we are destroying the possibility of building a new school. With our silence, we are lending support to the tyranny that takes away the future of the forcibly displaced children who are long waiting to put on their school uniforms. And with our in inaction and indifference, we are inflicting incalculable losses and damages to the people and the planet. I tend to believe that we are not the Leviathans for whom might is right. Rather, we all belong to the civilization that is mighty enough for ensuring the right. Excellencies, it is truly reassuring to find education on the agenda of the Paris Peace Forum. It reaffirms Bangladesh's call to posit education at the center of the culture of peace, which we firmly registered at the Transforming Education Summit held last September in New York. Bangladesh was chosen by the UNESCO member states to take up a role of high-level steering committee member for transforming education. This was perhaps entrusted upon us for our long-standing commitment for global education. We do not like to call us the champions, but our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has been a true leader for ensuring quality education for all, particularly the girls. During her leadership, we have ensured free education for girls up to the higher secondary level, undertaken stringent policies to prevent early marriage, child labor, and are also providing monetary incentives for retaining our students at schools. Unlike last year, she could not be present here today, but she gave me a clear message to pass on. Education and only education will determine the future shape of humanity. Distinguished colleagues, the world was already off track from attaining the SDG4 targets before COVID, with an annual funding gap of 200 billion US dollars. During the pandemic years, resources from everywhere had to be diverted to save life and livelihood. Immediately after the pandemic, we are now struck by the consequences of the war in Ukraine, which has triggered fuel and food crises. Unless we address these crises in right earnest and salvage education, we are then heading for a generational catastrophe. We have taken some decisive actions to develop a resilient education system in Bangladesh. We have heavily invested in deploying digital infrastructure so that our teachers and students benefit from e-learning. Our education budget for the fiscal year 2022-23 was increased by 95 million, making it 12% of the national budget. But that will not be enough. We need more schools, vocational training institutes, teacher training centers, and e-learning software and hardware. We need partners to come forward to support our initiatives. We have additional challenges to deal with. We have to deal with the learning losses. We have to address the needs of the climate change induced displaced students. Moreover, we have to provide support to 1.1 million forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals whose fate has long been rested on our political actions. It is a daunting task to attract private investment in education as this is not a commercial venture. So development partners will have to come forward with innovative financial mechanisms like IFFED, debt swap and grants to bridge the gap. Businesses can be motivated to con contribute as part of corporate social responsibilities. Countries can benefit from UNESCO initiatives like open science. Distinguished participants, with more than 700 million world's children and youth and the largest number of out-of-school children living in the LMICs, we cannot think of a global solution leaving them behind. The lower middle income countries have to face a complex set of additional conditionalities for funding which are imposed by many stakeholders. It is no surprise that the LMICs will face 80% funding gap by 2030. We have to address the challenges faced by LMICs without having to reduce competing allocations for low-income countries or for humanitarian crises. Our action towards innovating financing needs to be targeted, result-oriented. It needs to be targeted, result-oriented, sustainable, and justifiably designed. Excellencies, it is time to change the narrative. Quality education is not choice. Rather, it is our pledge to the future that we want and we committed. Education cannot wait for our political negotiations. Education has to be made a public good. We need to culminate the values of global citizenship and advocate education for peace. To end, let me quote from the UNESCO Constitution.
that since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed, end of quote. And that is possible only through education. Let us therefore invest in education for peace, invest in our common future. I thank you all. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabut. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you to remind us the, the importance of education for the, the peace culture. And that's what we need uh, today. Uh, and your call for making education a public goal. I'll give the floor now uh, with, to Mrs. Salma Badr, who is a senior analyst with COIS, to present the study commissioned by the leading group and currently being finalized on the role of innovating financing for education in the education crisis. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Gillo, and uh, thank you, Excellency, for this inspiring speech. Um, I'm honored to present uh, on behalf of COIS uh, this study that um, uh, was commissioned uh, by the leading group on innovative financing for development. Uh, and that we conducted in close collaboration with uh, the teams from the Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs um, of France, uh, that I would also like to thank. Uh, over 250 million children from 6 to 18 years old are still out of school worldwide, with an additional 20 million secondary school girls out of school due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet, uh, not only access to quality education is a fundamental right, but it's, it is also a key lever for sustainable development uh, of countries. In this context, and as you said, Mr. Gilou, the leading group on innovative financing for development initiated and commissioned the study with two objectives. First, updating the, financing, uh, the findings sorry, of the two previous studies conducted uh, in 2000. 10 and 2012 in light of the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as outlining the potential role uh, of innovative finance in supporting the SDG4 targets. This study focused on identifying the remaining challenges in primary and uh, secondary education in the post-pandemic context, analyzing specific education challenges in three countries, Bangladesh, Guatemala and Niger, as well as outlining key trends and providing recommendations to better leverage innovative finance for education. As you can imagine, progress is still needed to fully achieve the targets of the SDG4, with the most press pressing issues <coughs> Uh, being a lack of access to education, important inequalities in access to education at different levels, um, both between countries and within uh, countries, uh, particularly, particularly between boys and girls, um, as well as between different income groups. Uh, a lack of quality education, and finally a, a lack of equipment and adequate um, uh, education infrastructure. Of course, facing these, challenge, uh, these challenges and issues requires mobilizing massive resources that are lacking. Today, the annual funding gap in low and middle income countries uh, for the education sector is estimated at $200 billion. Uh, and to give you a point of comparison, uh, the official development assistance, assistance allocated to education only represented $15.9 billion in 2021. Therefore, innovative finance um, can play a major role in filling this financing gap. But first, what does innovative finance mean? Innovative finance um, refers to a range of instruments designed to raise additional funds for development and characterized by their complementarity with official development assistance, their predictability, as well as their stability. Innovative finance can help improve sustainability of funding, stimulate innovation and support the scale-up of promising solutions in the education sector, and improve effectiveness uh, in the allocation of resources. Let me give you a quick overview of innovative finance transactions in the education uh, sector uh, outlined in the study. So this study shows that innovative finance remains largely underdeveloped in the education sector as compared to other sectors. For example, uh, education represented only 4% of overall blended finance transactions in 2020 when energy-focused initiatives accounted for 35% of the total blended finance tr transactions during the same year. 
Uh, this study uh, allowed us to identify 69 education-focused initiatives, mobilizing uh, around $21 billion with ticket sizes ranging from uh, $500K um, uh, dollars to several billion dollars. And among these transactions, result-based financing mechanisms um, are the leading category of instruments deployed, followed by, a mixed, uh, by mixed and concessional capital structures, and finally, voluntary contributions. The study also uh, maps out some of the key obstacles likely to explain uh, the uh, underdevelopment of innovative finance in the education sector. And some of these barriers include the nature of education as a public service and a state prerogative for both planning and financing, the limited number of investable models in terms of both potential return of investment, product maturity, as well as capital absorption, um, an incompatibility between investors' timelines as well as donors' commitments uh, with the long timelines needed uh, for the materialization of education outcomes, as well as a high fragmentation of actors in need, mainly for work and capital. Let me now stop on uh, some of the recommendations outlined by this study. These recommendations can be summarized to three key uh, recommendations. First, innovative finance can be used as a key lever for supporting national uh, governments in, lo uh, government in longer-term planning and financing of education. Flexibility and adaptability of innovative finance instruments allow for a targeted al allocation of resources aligned with national priorities. Secondly, reporting requirements associated with the instruments imply uh, both capacity building and transparent monitoring of the, innovatives, uh, of the initiatives funded at a national level. And finally, result-based components of the instruments deployed often incentivize governments um, in their ownership of the interventions um, deployed. And to give you an example, the Common Fund for Education in Niger, um, which is a multilateral uh, grant fund with a performance-based component, um, allowed um, since its launch uh, to um, allocate uh, in a flexible way and a transparent and monitored way uh, resources from donor countries with uh, a great alignment with national uh, priorities. As a second recommendation, um, we outline the fact that innovative finance can be leveraged to attract additional capital towards education in a context where official development assistance is decreasing through three main ways. Uh, the first way being um, blending uh, multiple resources uh, sorry, blending multiple sources of capital that can be pulled into uh, financing facilities, therefore allowing for a larger funded potential. Uh, the second way is um, that innovative finance instruments allow to optimize risk allocation, therefore attracting more funders and uh, especially, for example, commercial investors. And uh, the third way being uh, that innovative finance instruments can help support new emerging models and innovation in the education space. For example, the International Financing Facility for Education, um, pre previously man mentioned by Your Excellency, was initiated in this perspective. The facility still uh, under development uh, aims at uh, both pooling capital from donor countries and providing uh, guarantees to multilateral development banks to provi provide lower uh, middle income countries with access to concessional debt financing, uh, which um, they often lack uh, access uh, through their uh, categorization as lower in uh, middle income countries. The third uh, key recommendation is that innovative finance can enable a more efficient allocation of resources by aligning interests of multiple stakeholders towards common objectives and also by clearly linking funding to concrete education outcomes, therefore supporting tangible progress in the quality of education. And as an example, impact bonds have been implemented in various contexts uh, with that objective uh, of linking the reimbursement of uh, investors who pre-finance a project in, in the education space to its concrete education outcomes. Um, so lastly, I, just, I would like to uh, thank you um, for um, uh, the um, invitation to present this uh, study. We are very much looking forward uh, for its publication and invite you to read uh, the full study that is being finalized. Thank you. 
Thank you, Salma. Just a question. When is this uh, study will be available? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think... Uh, in terms of weeks, months, days? Probably in terms of weeks. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, I will uh, we'll turn now to the three high-level experts who have joined us today. Alexander Rostami, who is Chief of Innovatis Finance Hub with the Office of Innovation at UNICEF. Welcome. Vanessa Martin, spokesperson at the Education Coalition, which gathers 23 French civil society organizations operating in the field of education. Welcome. And Bathilde Missica, head of Division Networks, Partnerships and Gender OECD Development Center. Welcome to. I will start by asking the first question to Alexander Rostami and Vanessa Martin concerning their views on the current situation. The COVID-19 pandemic has a detrimental impact on the access and quality of education and the level of funding needed to reach SDG 4. It has also changed more generally the investment landscape. In your views, to what extent the pandemic linked to COVID-19 change the expectations around innovating financing in general? And what role can innovating financing play today in improving the education sector? Mr. Rostami. Is it okay now? You hear me? Um, first of all, Your Excellencies, uh, great to be here. It's a privilege. Uh, thank you, Minister of Foreign Affairs, for arranging this, uh, the whole Peace Forum, and, and inviting me. Um, when it comes to the expectations, it's a total new environment we are in. COVID-19 changed everything. Um, first of all, as uh, Your Excellency, uh, Ms. Tipu Moni told us that education is not a commercial venture. So it really needs public intervention, government intervention. The expectation that private sector will solve everything, it's, it's too much. And public funding is needed. So one thing which has changed dramatically after COVID-19 is the decisions on cutting ODA, which we see taking place everywhere. And also redirecting ODA to Ukraine, which leaves much less funding, which can be used to leverage other sources of capital towards education. What we have also seen is the high inflation up to 40% in many countries, uh, higher interest rates, which means that governments in those countries has less resources to invest in education because they have to service their debt to uh, a lot of financial institutions. These two combined with consumers having less resources, decreased purchasing power, really limits the amount of capital uh, which is available for education, which creates a very uh, complicated situation and the need for collective action together to start innovate and to use the resources available in a most efficient manner. Thank you very much. And to pick up on what, what Mr. Rostami said and what implies for the education. Thank you. Um, do you listen to me? It's okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, thank you first for this invitation and for 
giving us the floor, as you just said. I'm part, uh, today I'm spokesperson for the Coalition Education, and just to let you know what it means, it means that we are um, a group of uh, French civil societies and that we carry out advocacy to strengthen the government's, the French education cooperation policy. And we um, also facilitate sharings of uh, field practices uh, to build CSO capacity and to inform public policy. So thank you. Thank you for uh, the presentation we, you just made. It's very interesting and I will share the findings with my colleagues and I'm sure it will initiate uh, very interesting discussions. But uh, first I would like to come back on the current situation, which is an alarming situation. Uh, as you just said, the COVID-19 cr crisis changed everything. It had tremendous impact on education, widening inequalities, and hitting the hardest, the most vulnerable people, especially when multiple factors of discrimination, such as gender, disability, or social economic background intersect. So today we have 244 million children out of school. We have 222 million children living in crisis situation and with urgent education needs. But according to the United Nations, education in emergency situation is underfunded with only 22% of the requested funds covered in 2021. So today there is a urgent need to transform, to transform education, to make education systems more resilient, drawing lessons from the various crises, in order to, gra to guarantee free, inclusive, uh, equitable, and quality education for all, leaving no one behind this time. And. I mean, to, to, to reach that goal, we need, um, we need to mobilize more to meet SDG 4. We need to, um, I mean, we can discuss additional funding mechanisms, of course, they might be interesting, they might be useful, but the thing is that we need to better work together. By together, I mean the local society, the civil society, uh, the states, uh, academics, private sectors, we must all work together to strengthen first the impact and the effectiveness of the already existing funding. We need to strengthen intersectoral and interministerial cooperation to highlight the transformative power of education, to find synergies and to collect more funding for education. The international community we all must ensure that all the commitments made at the test summit must are effective. We, the France and, and the other education champion countries uh, have now more than ever a role to play in advocating with donor countries and, and partner countries that budgets allocated to education are maintained and reinforced. Uh, the international community should support governments of partner countries to invest more and more efficiently in education um, through tax justice reforms or leverage mechanisms such as that of GPE. Um, aid to education. What is GPE? Uh, the, um, the, sorry. <laughs> sorry, the question surprised me. Um, <laughs> Um, so, aid to education must reach 0.7% uh, of GDP, with 20% um, um, devoted to education and targeting the most vulnerable people. Um, and, um, I mean, you donors, donors as well, should adopt a twin-track approach to funding, um, providing resources to 
strengthen uh, inclusive education systems, but at the same time delivering um, flexible multi-year specific funding to meet the needs of the most vulnerable people and tackling the obstacles that they might encounter, including uh, for children who are the most at risk of school exclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. So we'll go now to uh, my second question. Uh, it is now time to dive into specific innovative finance mechanism with Batil Misika and Alexander Rostami again. New tools are emerging, such as result-based financing mechanism or risk mitigation tools to encourage private sector participation in this sector. In your experience, how can we support the emergence of innovative financial mechanisms that are sustainable, truly additional, and market-driven? How is private capital and philanthropy in particular currently supporting global education? Mrs. Misika, I will let you start with this second question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to Claire for um, her trust. So um, just let me tell you where, where, where the, the remarks come from. At the Development Center of the OECD, we have a, we've had a network of foundations working for development for about 10 years, and we've been tracking philanthropy for development flows. So there's an open database that you can access and you can see. So um, how do we mobilize more um, private capital for global education? And in particular, how do we bring foundations to the table in a sustainable manner. So first, I would say we, it's time for us to get over the clash of civilizations. This is what we used to, to, to joke about that, you know, foundations and governments, you know, were, you know, dancing in separate rooms. And then when governments or aid agencies would talk to foundations, they would say, why don't you just, your checkbook, why don't you just give me some funding and I'll know what to do with it? Mm -hmm. Well, foundations would say, well, if you knew how to solve the world's problem, we would know by now. I'm new and I'm cool and I'm innovative. Well, the, the truth is somewhere in the middle. None of us can do it alone. Right, so we need to get over that. We were at, at the Transforming Education Summit. The philanthropic community asked um, our network and I, IEFG, which is the um, International Education Funders Group, to be the voice of philanthropy for education. Why? Because philanthropy for education was a bit tired of being just put under the financing pillar. So I'm just gonna say it right there. The financing gap is not gonna be met by philanthropy alone. That doesn't mean that it's not an interesting source of capital to do other things, but just, uh, so first, how much are we talking about? Our figures show that international philanthropy for development, so it means coming from um, mainly the North to um, ODA recipient countries, was about 500 million um, US dollars between 2016 and 2019, which is the last period for which we have data. This is nothing and this is a lot. This is about how much the government of Japan gives as education ODA. So it, it's, it's significant. The second interesting finding is that there is also 500 million coming from emerging markets. So domestic philanthropy has been largely ignored. Just to give you an example, there's a Lehman Foundation in Brazil. It works with the public sector to leverage uh, public investments. And nowhere in these UN mechanisms have we heard the voices of domestic foundations. You know, in India, domestic philanthropy has surpassed, and, the, and CSR capital is more than what is received from international sources. So that is something we need. Those are credible partners we need to deal with. And moreover, in all of the emerging markets we've surveyed, education is the number one sector supported. So that, that's great news. So um, it's not going to close the financing gap, but philanthropy capital is here um, to make capital more mobile and effective. It can de-risk some investments. Uh, so it's not just about more and plugging the gap. Um, I would, it's also discovery capital. So it has to be used as, as like that because, because piloting initiatives is something that philanthropy can do. I'll give you an example. On social and emotional learning, 
uh, you know, there's been a lot of experiments that donor agencies cannot necessarily do with, with, with public money and given how tight it has become and how much scrutiny it's under, you know, we need foundations to be piloting things. By the way, the PISA uh, measurement, the PISA um, index that you all know at the OECD, it, it started with philanthropic capital because it was a crazy idea once, once upon a time. So um, discovery capital, uh, really important. Now, um, we, we've, we've spoken about development impact bonds. Um, just to tell you on the philanthropic side, it's still an exception. So what's interesting is that it's 95% of the attention, but it's 1% of the financing. Um, over, we have 70,000 projects uh, in our database, 8,000 on education. Can you guess how many were linked to development impact bonds over that period? 12, 12 out, uh, out of uh, 8,000. So that is still marginal. We need to amplify um, these innovative financing mechanisms, but also remember ourselves that there are barriers. Why are they not used more? Well, because it takes specific competencies that foundations don't necessarily have. Uh, it takes a uh, risk appetite. And it also goes back to what I was, I was talking about. The, our communities are so siloed and uh, kind of reluctant to work with each other that actually coming together with the coalition and looking in the same direction is problematic. And then I'll end with that. Um, there is also the fact that when it comes to foundations, um, you should always be a bit mindful between what is said, so what are the ambitions and what the reality looks like. The reality is that, at least internationally, Foundations invest in upper middle income countries, in you know, nice coastal areas where all the donors are. Um, in our database, only two to 3% of philanthropic funding goes to fragile and low income countries. So I'm sorry, but you know, this is, we need to go beyond that. Education, when I hear foundations talk about how concerned they are with education poverty, I also wanna say, guys, get your act together, go to fragile states, you know, partner with ODA because this is what this is your res moral responsibility now. So I would say, so in some philanthropic capital, a very innovative and interesting new source of funding, it's not gonna be this, the magic silver bullet that's gonna address all our financing um, issues. However, it needs to be leveraged better and South-based philanthropy for education has to be taken into account more. Why? Because they know the grantees, they can, they're much closer to the issues, they fund the front lines, um, and they have very, usually very good relationships with other stakeholders. So for instance, if you can um, find a lot of data on philanthropy for education in South Africa, where we've done a deep dive uh, in Nigeria, please use this database. It is there to be used. Thank you very much. Thank you. Interesting presentation. I'll turn now to Alexander. Uh, what can do UNICEF to encourage the private sector to finance this very underfinanced social sector? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I forgot to thank you for the presentation when I started last time. So thank you. It was a good presentation and uh, looking forward to uh, study it when it's uh, launched. Uh, and I also forgot to cover the second part of the first question. Uh, so I'm just gonna quickly talk about that. And it also because of uh, what you said, the challenges uh, and the current situation which you brought up, it, it really also showcase how new innovative financing is as a sector or practice uh, and it really needs to be further developed and also broadened. Uh, we most of the time emphasize the resource mobilization part from private sector, that part in innovative financing. But innovative financing is really a practice where we bring in a lot of actors from different sectors to together uh, work towards solutions, which doesn't necessarily maybe mean uh, investments from private sector, but it's that part 
to work together. And what UNICEF does, I think that multilaterals, UN agencies, uh, ICRC, and all international organizations with a track record and experience from the countries that we we are in. I mean, UNICEF has 100, we are present in 190 countries. And especially when it comes to humanitarian space, fragile and conflict, I agree that it's, it's a total different world to uh, come to Kenya, where I worked for UNHCR, and spend time with donors in Gigiri, in Nairobi, and uh, the coastal line, than Kakuma or Dadaab in Garissa, Wajir, and Tukana County, where, <laughs> where the needs are. That's where we should be. Uh, those other parts are you know, covered. Uh, and most of the investments are directed to those places. So I think more focus on humanitarian and fragile, fragile states is key. And that's where UNICEF and others uh, can play an important role to coordinate, to become that actor which connects civil society with private sector, faith-based organizations, financial institutions, donors, philanthropy, foundations, local foundations, local high net worth individuals. I think in all the countries I have been in, there is always a request, why is it that everything is built up in global north? Why are these financing instruments all based out of Luxembourg? <laughs> uh, why, why isn't any vehicle where I can invest in, in my own country, with my resources, if I was a high net worth individual in in, in, in one of the countries which uh, needs investments, that's a demand which we need to address. Uh, and just, we talk about innovative financing, we talk about the need to bring all the actors together, but at the same time, 90% up to 98% of all our staff are working in traditional models. There's very little resources spent on innovative financing from donor side and multilateral side. And that needs to happen uh, to, to really uh, have enough resources to bring all the actors together. Thank you, Alexander. We'll come to our third part of this, uh, these exchanges, and thank you very much. Time flies. As a conclusion to our panel, we'll now discuss the current issues and challenges. Innovative finance has become a buzzword in the last years when we look for funding for education. Yet, innovative finance remains underdeveloped in the education sector compared to others. In your opinion, what are the limitations and challenges encountered by philanthropic funding today? And how innovative financing initiatives strengthen country ownership of the education development process? Mrs. Martin, what are your thoughts on these questions and subject? Thank you. Um, I'm sure new innovative mechanisms, funding mechanisms, can do a lot. I mean, it means money, a lot of money, and we need money, definitely. But we also need to be cautious. And I think that some essential points must be underlined and remembered. Education is a human right. It is a public good. Therefore, it is the sole responsibility of the states to implement it. Any intervention by the private sector must be controlled and supervised by the states. 
I'm, I'm sure you've all, uh, you've all heard about these private schools where today quality education is not guaranteed at all. You have numerous reports today carried out in Senegal or in Mali denouncing the lack of regulation on private schools and how they have increased inequalities for families and doomed um, teachers to precarious working conditions. So today, um, priority must be given to the financing of public education systems. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Abidjan principles, which compile and clarify uh, existing provisions of international human rights law, and how it explain, how it provide guidance on how to put them into practice um, to uh, to, uh, to to how to how to use them in the context of uh, the rapid expansion of uh, the private sector in education. And the third point I, I have, I want to, to underline is that education must remain free, um, equitable, it must remain of high quality starting with basic education, uh, equitably distributed and targeting the most vulnerable people. So at this Yes, uh, as a consequence of this, um, these mechanisms, these new financing mechanisms should not exacerbate inequalities, leading to the risk, at the risk of leading to human rights violations and the progressive privatization of some essential services. These mechanisms should not increase the debts of countries. They should use tools such as the education debt swaps. I mean, education cannot be financed by loans, but only by grants. Uh, third, as you just said, this mechanism should better take into account the local context. It should um, inclusively cooperate with the local civil society and it should adapt its financing, the, the, the project funding and the um, monitoring methods to local capacities. Uh, and at last, uh, this mechanism uh, should follow the leave no one behind principle. Uh, these mechanism will have to um, target as a priority uh, regions and people that are the most affected by the lack of access to basic essential services and they will have to focus on low-income countries, as you said. So, um, it's um, in no case, these mechanisms can be associated with profitability or return, financial return on investment. As a conclusion, uh, I will just say that uh, we need to be cautious, very, very cautious with the with all these funds. I mean, this seems attractive, we need money, we face an alarming situation, of course. But if these mechanisms are too numerous, neither the states nor the civil society will be able to correctly monitor them. And this will lead to confusion, lack of cooperation and greater inefficiency. And today, honestly, inefficiently Inefficiency is the last thing that we need to cope with the multiple crises that heavily weigh on education and that pose a major threat to the future of entire generations. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Martin, for this warning. I'll give the floor now to Mrs. Misika. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So, what are the challenges? Well, um, if you if you take philanthropy. Um, the funding is still very short term, uh, in, in spite of what they say. Uh, we conducted a um, deep dive. There's this group in Switzerland called Friends of Education. So it brings all the foundation that fund education in Switzerland and um, in the world. And we looked at um, the grants. And the grants were on average two to three years. And the ambitions that these foundations had was um, some include uh, advocacy, change social norms. So let me ask you, do you really think that with two to three year grants, 
You can change social norms. You can change gender norms. I mean, seriously. So um, there is a, a question of also of ambition and time frame. This is a long game. So first, uh, short-termism. The second opposition I see, and I'm, um, I'll go back to what Vanessa Martin has been saying about uh, leave no one behind. You have a contradiction. Private capital looks for value for money, and value for money is not compatible with leave no one behind. Those are two different things. Leave no one behind, you might not get the biggest bang for your buck, as we say, but you're, you're, you're pursuing a very different objective which is one of social justice, of access to a basic, a, a basic public good. So I think we also need to be very clear about when are we putting together a hype, cool, new um, PPP that's uh, meant to create value for money for the investors versus leave no one behind, which requires a different mindset. For example, asking philanthropic capital to de-risk investment. This can be first loss capital. Meaning, you know, yes, you can lose it, but guess what? You've already decided to give it away, so you might as well be prepared to lose it. But you would find in reality, very few foundations where actually part of the capital is used as risk capital that is meant to be to try things or to de-risk investments where no commercial um, investor will go. So um, that, I, I think that's the, second, uh, that's the second hurdle. The third one is there's not a lot of PPPs in, 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 in practice bring in philanthropy, especially domestic philanthropy, as it should, because we've all said it. It's a fundamentally domestic agenda, but with a global component, which is make, what makes it so difficult. Um, and going back to some of the principles, I always find it useful to remind everyone of the Paris principles, the Paris Declaration principles, which is what is good donorship? I haven't found anything that's better than that. It's very, it's, to me, it's the, the, the uh, apple pie and motherhood of development. It is. You should take, the government has, you know, should have the ownership of their own agenda. As a partner, you need to align behind it. Um, you need to support it by aligning behind it, and you need to harmonize so that it doesn't become a huge headache for the government to be talking to uh, 12 different donors that all think they've come up with the best ideas and sliced bread. And finally, you should work for development results. I mean, you should monitor uh, and look to support results. What does success look like? It's, you know, in the philanthropic community, we hear a lot of fads like now trust-based philanthropy, decolonized philanthropy. It's all very nice, but just go back to very humble practice of aligning and supporting the government in what it wants to do. I think that would already save us a lot of uh, fancy words and headaches. And finally, um, on what can bring about more ownership, because this is what we're talking about, that, you know, governments have their own plans for education and we should support their ownership. Uh, well, social impact bonds can be good that way, because um, when you develop a social impact bond as a government, you have to basically price the outcome. You have to identify what are your national priorities. Uh, so that creates ownership. You know, that creates leadership. It's not the donor that says, oh, I've come up with a really new and cool idea of a new fund that's going to do, you're, that's going to focus on higher education. You're like, but with all due respect, I've been focusing on ECD, on early childhood development. It doesn't matter because me, I have this really cool fund and I've piloted it. And you're like, well, this is another issue that we observe. A lot of donors come and they're, they, they're not happy because their evidence, they've come up with really interesting studies, but their evidence is not taken up by policymakers. You know why? Because if you've been focusing on early childhood development and I arrive with my findings on um, higher education, it's like saying, oh, I've come up with the best brownie recipe. And you said, but we're, we're diabetic. It doesn't matter because it's the best brownie in the market. You know, that's not what I wanted. So that's something else that, you know, I feel it, this is going back to very simple principle, people. Yes, so I'll close here and I'll, I'll leave you with a quote that I really like these days, which is, the future is already here, but it's not evenly distributed. So this is why we're here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Martin and Batil, for this very stimulating discussion and exchange. We'll turn now, uh, we'll put the, an end to this uh, panel and I'll give the floor now to um, the chair of the leading group in 2022 Rwanda. My sincere appreciation to His Excellency Ambassador 
François Nkuliki Yumfura, Ambassador of Rwanda to France. Rwanda's approach to sustainable development is definitely a topic of interest for its focus on innovation, civil society strengthening, and philanthropy as an alternative way to mobilize resources for development. Mr. Ambassador, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you have the floor. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much. Um, Christophe Guillou is uh, an ambassador too, uh, former ambassador in Cameroon, right? And Djibouti. And Djibouti. Uh, <coughs> Honorable Minister, distinguished panelist, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, it's such a pleasure being here and uh, participating in this uh, edifying uh, session on uh, innovative financing. But first of all, allow me to thank our panelists. Uh, thank you for such an amazing and enlightening um, presentations. Uh, I look forward to have your report once it's ready, or it's public, as you put it already uh, in distribution in the coming week soon. Please share with us, with all of us. I know my good friend, Batile, for uh, already, what, four or five months I'm here. She's an amazing person, but uh, we've been discussing other sectors. Now I've learned today what uh, she can do in education, so we have to continue part of our discussion after this session. Uh, yes, uh, to the other panelists, once again, thanks for this amazing presentation. Yes, again, we probably may say and uh, repeat the obvious about education, but again, really. Uh, education is a, is a powerful change of, our, of developing in our society. Education is among the, the highest priority, if I may at least talk about Rwanda. And of course, it, is, it, it improves health and livelihoods. It contributes to social stability and stimulates long-term uh, development and uh, economic growth. Therefore, it is more than important today to reflect on uh, innovative financing mechanism in the education sector. We've, we've heard a lot about the, the panelists here. I was taking a lot of notes, but I'll come back to that on some points where um, I'm sure probably the Minister of uh, Education doesn't want to hear about swap debt, about uh, uh, this bond and that bond. She wants to see resources on the table so that she can be able to finance uh, her sector. Um, indeed, as mentioned by our, our, our distinguished panelists, yes, uh, the COVID-19 crisis has impeded efforts of quality education and it threatened to erode education gains in the last uh, decade. Madam, you mentioned, you insisted on that. It is clear that this pandemic has exacerbated the learning crisis and contributed to, ri to rising inequalities. The pandemic interrupted the learning of about 250 million young boys and girls on the African continent, 250 million. Sometimes we say, we say numbers, we say numbers in trillions of financing in, uh, as you speak today, good in, in Ukraine, but then we, when we come back to financing here, you see the impacts uh, on 250 million young boys and girls in, on the African continent. Governments previously allocated an average of 18% uh, of their budget to education sector. With the negative impact of the COVID, that COVID has had on our government, limited budget, the education sector finds itself competing for funds with other sectors across the, the government. Talking about the role of the innovative financing can play today in improving the education sector, we believe, we believe that education in the, in the innovators can help deliver higher quality education outcomes at lower costs. Education Example of innovative education approaches for remedial learning to close the, learn, uh, the learning gap created by COVID, targeted program to ensure that girls return to school after COVID and teachers, parents training for use of digital tools during school's closure. Regarding education financing, Rwanda has committed to increase the volume of public spending to meet international benchmarks. Rwanda has maintained an excellent relation with its development partners, resulting in considerable level of financial and technical support. Its strong records on good governance and robust financial system 
have attracted uh, direct on budget support. Development partners continue to play an important role in increasing the flows of funds through budget support funding, education program and projects, and providing, of course, technical assistance where necessary. DPs also play an active role in policy dialogue and monitoring progress in the education sector. Although our government has demonstrated a strong commitment to the education sector considering the current economic outlook, not only in Rwanda but globally, budgetary allocations to the education sector is not likely to, 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 to increase. And again, you've mentioned the, the cut of uh, ODA funding uh, uh, a few minutes ago. So countries and development partners, therefore, should not only focus on increase in volume of budgetary allocations, but also in improving efficiency, efficiency in allocation and utilization of available resources to maximize results for our children. We've come up with uh, several projects have been indeed, indeed developed in Rwanda, focusing on the one specific needs, which is the, the fourth industrial revolution. These include centers of, of excellence, which specialized mandates are for developing high level academic uh, and research capacity to address challenges facing not only Rwanda, but also the region. Therefore, we came up with the African Institute for Mathematical Science, the Center of Excellence in Biomedical Engineering, the Center of Excellence in Vaccine Immunization and Health Supply Chain Management, a Center of Excellence in Biodiversity and Natural Resources. There's also, this also includes the establishment of a Center of Excellence in ICT in partnership with the Carnegie Mellon University. We call it Carnegie Mellon Africa, CMU, which is based, today based in, uh, in Rwanda. The success of this initiative, which has now completed almost 10 years since its establishment, has led to significant, significant funding supports, most notably from uh, the MasterCard Foundation, who have uh, recently announced a 270, almost $280 million partnership uh, with, uh, which will significantly expand advanced engineering and technology education at uh, the CMU Africa in Kigali. Dear friends, uh, before I conclude, because I think uh, my minutes are running, you, the moderator gave me only five minutes. I, I want to, to come back on uh, some of the aspects which I mentioned, the funding. I was looking at my notes and uh, Yes, reduction of ODA funding, the bond you mentioned. But again, something very important, Madam, you mentioned. We need public funding. We don't need loans. We don't need, we mainly need grants or highly concessional loans for uh, some of our countries. And again, as I just mentioned, when the minister will hear debt swap, we hear uh, the bonds. Uh, uh, Batile was just mentioning, she just say, no, I need more financing. And there is one aspect which I think I didn't hear on this table, uh, which was a topic a few weeks ago, actually a few months ago. It's about the use of our SDRs, special drawing rights at the IMF. We are talking here of 650 billion US dollars. I don't know about the uh, East Asia region, but in Africa, where it's only, the allocation for Africa is only 33 billion. But we all know that the rest of the SDRs are not going to be used. You're right, you know? So how can we tap into those resources? Yes, we can tap into an innovating financing mechanism, but these are not enough. These are, should be here to complement what you already have. But we do have access. We do have access to the SDRs. And probably this room and some of our bosses, what kind of a message should we give them? Uh, targeting the education sector, targeting the health sector, and we leave the rest. Because when it comes to uh, raise resources, we were very keen and extremely happy and push for uh, resources in Ukraine. I can. I will not mention the project, the, the institution, but one institution was ready to disburse 10 billion, 10 billion for one project in the Ukraine. I don't say don't, please, I'm not saying do not finance Ukraine. 
But when it comes to this region, do we are able to easily mobilize resources? Why can't we mobilize resources and tap into the existing funding within the IMF? So in your study and probably in some of your conclusions, look into, look into the SDRs and see where you can uh, add two or three more paragraphs. Thank you so much, Mr. Moderator. Thanks once again. Thank you, Madam Minister, Your Excellency, panelists. That was a very stimulating discussion. And I was just, uh, as you all, very uh, frustrated by the time limitation, but uh, I look forward to continue these exchanges and try to be more active on, on the Secretariat and on the, uh, this uh, innovative group of uh, on finance. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice day and enjoy your weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you.